Well, I think clearly she was threatened. I mean, I, I, that's the that's the prime approximation. Or like you said, you know, maybe she wants them to think she's not investigating or something. But undoubtedly, a major reporter goes into hiding and is dead 24 hours later in a suspicious death with a car blowing up. I mean, this is... And now the police tapes have been released with witnesses saying, oh, it's driving down the road, it blows up, and then goes off the road into a tree. That's what all the other witnesses said. Yeah. So it just keeps piling on. I want this to be a regular crash. I don't like knowing they could come do this to me at any moment. I mean, it's not like I want this to be a government murder. What are your sources saying he was working on? Well, as we all know, was, well, like I said from the get-go, it was the CIA. More... Now that's coming out, yeah. Yeah, so people are starting to, you know, come out and say that. The other things as well were uh, he was in direct contact with Barrett Brown, who was arrested in, what was that, 2011 in Dallas? 2012, somewhere right there? Because I know he's been in jail for about a year now. Um, Michael was talking to him. That was the CIA guy. He was the guy that was working on Project PM, who was uh, doing a lot of computer hacking into the government that they were looking, they were doing mass spying on yeah. Americans. And he kind of uncovered a lot of that, and then they raided, the FBI raided his house and put him in jail. So but he was also talking to a former CIA guy who was in North Africa, who they put in prison. He was talking to a lot of people, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he had a lot of things going on, but that Barrett Brown thing was a definitely key thing because he even got a copy of the warrant that had all the arresting people involved on there. So, I mean, that, that in itself, the McChrystal thing, this, looking into the CIA, all these things add up to, you know, there's a lot of people pissed off at him. Well, uh, they killed uh, Aaron Schwartz, too, undoubtedly, who was really giving him trouble. We're going to come back from break, and I want to talk about uh, why he changed. Because you talked about this yesterday. You know, usually he was a lot nicer on TV. He wasn't as, in the weeks before, he's like, we got to get them. The government's evil. We got to get together. They're bad. They're coming after us. And he was like, I'm going to break something big. I mean, what was it? Think about this. What was it he learned that wasn't just, oh, they're spying on us or something? What had freaked him out? I think it was 9-11. I, I mean, my gut tells me he, he broke into the big stuff. And uh, that's the big... I mean, I interviewed Barry Jennings, who was the deputy head of New York Emergency Management, on this show. And he said, no, they blew up Building 7. They had bombs in there. They told me he was dead two weeks later. I mean, just dropped dead. And the family moved out a week later. It was like some witness protection deal. In fact, some say that he probably staged his death and put him under national security. We'll be right. I mean, I interview a lot of people end up dead. I had tried everything. I'd cut back the amount of food I was eating. I was lifting weights and jogging, but nothing was working. My body was literally starving for minerals and trace elements as well as key vitamins. And as soon as I had that, I immediately could eat half of what I was eating previously and be satisfied. Now, there are hundreds of great products at InfoWarsTeam.com, but I want to point out the three that have helped me lose 37 pounds in just two months. Products like Beyond Tangy Tangerine, Pollen Burst, and Rebound. When I started taking the Tangy Tangerine and other products every day, I lost more than 37 pounds in just two months. Now, that's results. I want to challenge my listeners to go to InfoWarsTeam.com and to order just three of their products, and you will see the changes in the way you look, feel, and in your appetite almost immediately. Start your journey to health and wellness today. InfoWarsTeam.com. All right, folks, we're going a little bit in the next hour with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. And then in studio, we're going to have one of my favorite filmmakers, Dan Dix, who's got her working with us on Obama Deception. Two with one of his uh, other um, members of uh, Press for Truth. So I look forward to getting some updates from him just on trying to shoot B-roll around the country uh, and the type of harassment he got from the police and people and the supposedly free nation. So that's coming up. Uh, Joe Biggs here with us. Uh, a good friends with the now deceased, uh, really patriot for the First Amendment, uh, Michael Hastings. Um, talk about, I mean, repeat what you said yesterday uh, uh, in your own words about the change you saw in him in the weeks leading up to his death. And now you said you've gone back and reviewed the videos. I mean, there was real, real concern there. Yeah, you know, when, when this all happened, I was very suspicious of everything. So I kind of sat down and I was like, all right. I need to go over a checklist. I need to create how he was, what things are happening now, you know, what I know, and then try to start trying to put the pieces together, see if any of this leads up to anything at the time. You know, this is just, you know, the days after. 
So I got on YouTube and I was like, you know, I think I'm going to start looking at a lot of his recent or, you know, interviews from starting about a year back. And then I want to start seeing them up until I, I watched his last one that was on the Young Turks, I believe. And uh, we got to do something. They're coming for us. Yeah. You know, like, you know, the first interviews I'm watching, you know, he's, you know, he's very calm and, you know, you know, Obama's great. We're doing all this good stuff, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, you know, towards the end, it's like, you know, they're, they're trying to keep us from, you know, saying what we want to say. They're, they're going to come after us, you know, if we speak the truth, you know, and he just, his whole persona just shifted and he went from, you know, being this calm person to, like you said, apparently finding something out in that time frame leading up to his death to where he just felt like, you know, the press was under attack and he needed to be a hard charger. He needed to, to you know, stand up and people needed to see that, you know, it, it's affecting everyone out there. That's a normal response to tyranny is to act like that. People go, oh, it's so strange. That's how you're supposed to act when your country's being overrun by crooks. What do you, what does your gut tell you he was discovering? I mean, we know it was CIA, it was government hacking, it was, but I mean, is that enough to make him act like that? I mean, he, he was working on many stories, multiple stories, as we've said. I mean, any of that altogether. I mean, the stuff with Project PM is a big thing for me because all that hacking stuff that Barrett Brown was involved in was, you know, bringing to light that the government was mass spying on, you know, reporters and all these people. So I think that probably is it because he was like, they're persecuting the press. They're coming after us. We've got to stand up against them. Yeah. And, and so I think that probably was it from what he said on that last interview. I mean, that's all it could be. I mean... I'm, I mean, to have that kind of job, to have that, his name's out there. He's a big person, you know, as far as, you know, worldwide known, you know. So to be, to see that kind of stuff, to see that our government's going to try to, you know, hush, hush everyone, that definitely, you know, is going to upset you. And, I mean, that's definitely what happened. We're going to go to break and come back and have five more minutes. It's, it's been great having you here in town. We'll finish up discussing that. But um I'm not calling the Young Turks out because that's not what I do. I mean, I call, I'll call people out for what they say that's wrong. But they said they were such good buddies with him. They've gone with the official story. Like all these so-called liberals that were friends with this guy have just gone with the official story. The, the, I mean, that's some great friends to have there, let me well, tell you. Some of those guys that work there, though, even reached out to me. And they're the ones that helped me confirm that Mike had had the cops come there. You know that people had visited them and the time okay well then maybe i missed it have they done shows on no, that no, no. I, they haven't said anything they've just told me in emails you know that's what they have said back that's even them. worse yeah so they're out there in la they know about all this and then they, and, they, and then they're not doing anything about it see that shows they're not just dumb liberals they're scared and, and if everybody gets scared of the tyrants they're going to take over don't people get that that only free people that have courage will be free if, you, if you're scared of tyrants, they'll take over. Unbelievable. That just blew me away. Wow. We'll be right back with the final segment with Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really glad we got this man to town, uh, Sar Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs. The only person out of all these military people that knew Michael Hastings, the young Turks that confirmed to him that, oh no, his brother was there, they were checking out his car, the police had been to his house, feds, they just called him feds, uh, and then his car blows up and he dies, and I'm not trying to start a fight with the young Turks, it's just, it's really lonely, and, and what's scary is all the cowardice. What's scary is that he was friends, reportedly, and hung out with those people. Listen, if somebody kills me, man, my friends better well come out and, and, and call for an investigation. Or, bare minimum. I mean, it's just so dishonorable that you, I, I should, I guess, debrief you better. I'm not a cop or an interrogator. That's why I don't know how to get all the info out of you. You're like, oh, no, I talked to the Young Turks, too. They, you know, they're people, they're producers. They know. They're the ones that gave me this, this, and that. They're out there with the whole investigation team. And then they were telling you, oh, yeah, no, this is real fishy. Uh, comments on that or comments on other tidbits people have told you? Um, that was just the, the one thing that kind of helped me, like, get my investigation going in a certain direction. You know, when I heard that from them, it was that was definitely some helpful, helpful things for me to get on the right track, I would say. And uh, like I said, I don't know what they put out to the public as far as what they think happened and... Yeah, to be fair, I don't follow all of it, but I probably would have heard about it. I, I, I've seen them about him. 
They just go, it's too bad. What a great guy. He's gone. I mean, I, I watched their memorial thing. They did a nice memorial piece on him and a video of all the interviews they've had. And it was really good. And I mean, from the way that Michael kind of showed passion on that show, it seemed like he did feel safe there with him. I mean... Well, my issue is, is I could say, oh, look at those fools having no idea what world they live in. But if the producer's like, oh, yeah, we know about the feds and all this, while the feds are on the news going, we didn't visit him, but his email says that that's happening, it's just like it becomes complicit. When, when you know stuff's going on, you don't say anything. I was always curious as to why the FBI released a statement saying they weren't investigating him, and that happened before I even released the email. So how did they even know that? Well, like you said, when you were out at uh, in the Army stationed in... Uh, El Paso at what, Camp Biggs? That's funny, same yeah, name as you. Biggs Army Airfield. Yeah, yeah. yeah that uh, they say it's the safest city in the country. Tell folks what they'd say. There's no crime here, but, but in the parking lot there was shootings. Yeah, here. I mean, you know, there was, you get there and you, you have your uh, incoming briefing of how El Paso is. And they tell you that, you know, exactly. It's one of the safest cities in the U.S. And don't believe all that stuff you see on the news. And then, you know, I'm out here in the streets of UTEP, University of Texas, El Paso. And. There's drive-bys that happen, and I mean, it's not an everyday occurrence, but I mean... You said heads on the ground, though. But I mean, they dig up hundreds of bodies. It's unbelievable. Yeah, there was always gang violence and stuff like that. You know, you'd hear about it in the news and or they would find bodies sometimes just off to the side of the road and, you know... But their slogan is, safest city in the U.S. That's the yeah. only reason I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. I'm not trying to attack El Paso, but that's as close to hell as you can get. I mean, when I've driven through there and it's all those weird, like, it's like apocalyptic, all those crumbling mountains and antennas and military wreckage everywhere. I mean, it's weird, man. Well, it's definitely like being in Kuwait. I mean, you, I was scared a lot of times there. I mean, I told a lot of the guys when I came back from overseas, I was like, it's almost worse. I'd rather go back to Afghanistan. I kept begging. I was like, let me deploy. <laughs> I'd rather be in Afghanistan than be in El Paso another day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I felt safe in Afghanistan sometimes. Yeah, you were saying that the apartments you stayed in were just full of FBI, DEA, but you'd hear shootings in the parking lot. Yeah, the FBI had their little uh, uh, building right across the street from where my apartment was. And uh, then on base, they have something called Epic El Paso Intelligence Center, and that's DEA, FBI, and all that stuff that they have there. That's the safest city in America. Yep. <laughs> well, man, good job for the press. Good job for freedom. Good job to just give some defiance to this tyranny and say, hey, we don't buy all your lies. And we appreciate you standing up for the press and for Michael Hastings. Thank you, sir, for having me. You bet. And I'm glad his wife's all at ease now and just says everything's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I guess some people think it's all peachy now. I still don't think so, though. Well, I mean, come on. Our government doesn't ever kill members of the press. No, never. And the NSA doesn't spy on us without warrants. And El Paso is the safest city. And the government doesn't ship drugs in. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're something else, Sergeant uh, Joe Biggs. Now you can watch the InfoWars nightly news streaming live as it happens for free. Check it out at InfoWars.com forward slash show.